Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Peter. I'm uh, what's known in the Navy as a METOC. That's an acronym for Meteorologist Oceanographer. Um, it's quite a broad spectrum of, of knowledge, and it's not just the weather. As you'll see in a few minutes' time, it extends much further than that and much, much uh, more involved than just simply the weather. Now, what we'll start off with is by explaining to you um, there, is a system, there is a type of weather that there, there's a type of weather that we call space weather. And we're going to investigate that to a certain extent. And we're going to start by looking at the layers of the atmosphere directly above us. It has many layers. And we've got an example here. I want you to look first right near the surface, near the ground, this layer here. And you'll see there that we've got um, mountains, volcanoes, clouds, rain, all manner of things. And that's called the tropos troposphere. And that very small layer is where we live and where everything that goes on on our planet exists. All life as we understand it is within this troposphere. And it only extends up to about um, 10 kilometers or so where we, where we are. Uh, it's bigger at the equator. Uh, it goes up to about 18 kilometers and it compresses down to about eight kilometers over the poles. Now then, What's special about this uh, other layer? Well, let's move up upwards a little bit. We'll go beyond the troposphere into this next layer, which is the stratosphere. And the stratosphere is very important because it contains something called the ozone layer. And the ozone layer is the layer that protects us from harm from this space weather that we're going to talk about in a little while. Uh, next, above that, we've got the mesosphere, but the only thing we see in the mesosphere is uh, perhaps meteorites burning up as they enter our atmosphere. Um, above that, we've got the thermosphere, which is getting very warm indeed because it's now being direct by the sun and its incoming radiation. And you'll notice there, just over towards the left, some funny coloured things. That's the aurora, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, finally, we get the exosphere. That's the last layer before we actually go into outer space. Uh, and that's where we'll find all the satellites. And trust me, there's hundreds of them, hundreds. Um, in fact, there's thousands. A lot of it is now uh, defunct and is space junk. And slowly but surely, will come out of orbit and descend and burn up in the mesosphere, uh, hopefully never actually reaching the ground. But what I want to do next is look at um, this business of the troposphere and how important it is. Now, this picture uh, is, oh, sorry. This picture was taken from the shuttle. It's uh, a very commonly seen picture. It's in the public domain. Uh, it doesn't need referencing. You'll see here a very thin blue line which follows the arc of the Earth's surface, the curvature of the Earth. That very thin blue line, everybody, is the troposphere. And you can see in the fullness of space how tiny it really is and how delicate it is. There's a, a thundercloud here just pointed to with the mouse. Uh, that actually reaches up through the troposphere and stops at the, the what's called the tropopause, uh, where the stratosphere starts. And you can see it's like a flat top because it's hit the stratosphere and started to level out. Uh, and that gives you some idea of scale. That very small layer is it from the ground to there is the troposphere. Very thin, very small, but it's where we all live, where we all exist and without we need to protect it. It's very delicate. It's very small in the full um, stage of things. And it's, it's very delicate. We need to protect it. And how we protect it is part of what we're going to talk about today. Now, moving on from that, we have this solar wind that you heard me mention earlier. It's not a wind in the sense that we understand it because there's no air in space. This... Oh, Go back. Uh, here's the sun 
on the, to the left of the screen and you can see it glowing brightly, bright red, and there are some horizontal lines across the, the slide heading towards Earth, which is the sort of purpley thing that's shown here. They, that is the solar wind, and it's carrying charged particles and lots of plasma, which contains enormous amounts of energy from the sun. It actually carries two different types of energy, electromagnetic energy, and it's got um, uh, light energy in the form of photons. And they are bombarding our Earth continuously all the time. And there are billions of tons of this stuff thrown off the sun in all directions, every second of every day, and has been doing so for about, uh, well, 4.6 billion years now that we know of. This stuff is coming our way, but you'll see it's deflected when it gets close to the Earth. They bend. They bend around the Earth, these lines of, of uh, energy coming towards us. And what's happening here is we have, what we have is um, a magnetic field around our Earth, which protects us from the harmful stuff that the cosmos throws at us. And more specifically, our own sun throws tons of this stuff at us and it's very harmful and it can be so moving on from that we now know that it gets bent now let's look at the next slide there if we if our earth was perfectly circular and the magnetic center was uh, the core was a, a perfect magnet like the sort of thing you would do experiments with at home or in a science lab, then we would have a nice, perfect magnetic field around us, as you see here. The North and South Poles um, connected by lots of lines of magnetic field, and they would look nice and perfect like that. But of course, this isn't the perfect world. This is the real world. And what we have here, a better description is you can see the solar wind coming from the left of the screen, coming from the sun, hitting our magnetic field, and it will compress it on the sunward side here and cause it to distend on the leeward side. And where it bends around, it distorts the magnetic field and causes all sorts of things to happen in our upper atmosphere, depending on which bit of our Earth is facing the sun at any time. Bearing in mind, we're rotating 20, once every 24 hours uh, a, a day, each day. Uh, I would just want to point out to you, with the, the thing itself is referred to as the magnetosphere, and uh, where the magnetosphere ends, and the next layer uh, or part of our surrounding begins is called a magnetopause. That's there with that's where the magnetosphere ends. It's always given that phrase pause. Same with the stratosphere, tropopause, troposphere, the tropopause, and obviously next after that, the stratosphere. When that finishes, that's the stratopause. Moving on from that then. Now, here's where we can see the visible effects of radiation hitting our upper atmosphere. The uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, causes the ions uh, to become uh, charged particles and they hit the ions in the upper atmosphere and cause them to glow because they've input a, a tremendous amount of energy. Now, when you've seen these, if you've seen a film, a movie, it's always um, speeded up. It's not real because if you, I'm fortunate enough to have witnessed this and it's a very, very slow transition, but it's stunningly beautiful. It's absolutely amazing to see. Um, I spent a lot of years at sea uh, and never saw it. Um, and then a few years ago, my wife and I decided to push the boat out, went on a cruise and saw it. And uh, it was it was a wonder to see. It's awesome. And the colours of the gases, the colours of the glow, give an indication of which ions uh, are being um, ionised or uh, given energy to, to cause them to glow. And the different colours, and, and forgive me, I don't know this, um, but uh, there's uh, blue, red, green. Uh, all of these can glow in different uh, different ways. 
uh, and I can't honestly can't remember which gas is which to give the colour. Uh, not my part of ship. Right, so that's the magnetic field and what it causes. I want to give you some idea of the amount of energy that's in this radiation coming, and that's where I'm going to go to the next slide. There. Here we're looking at the, the different types of radiation. And we've got shortwave radiation and longwave radiation. Now, the shortwave radiation is the very short stuff is up here, gamma rays. Uh, these are ionizing radiation. We've got extreme ultraviolet, near ultraviolet, near infrared, mid infrared and far infrared. Now the visible spectrum, that's the bit that we humans can see is just that tiny little band there. That's what we can see. Uh, certain animals can see extended bits of it. The nocturnal animals can see um, into the near and mid infrared. We can't, we stop at that point. Uh, this is what humans can see. And then we come further down into the longer, longer wavelengths until we get to the very high frequency radio waves. And the energy that's contained in these, in gamma rays, for example, uh, very, very short wave, uh, extremely short wavelengths, but they contain uh, the amount of of energy is 1.24 mega electron volts that's 1.24 million electron volts and we go to the other extreme and we go down to the very uh, long wavelengths um, the the long wavelength stuff uh, up at these super high frequencies where we've got 124 micro electron volts so there's a 10 to the 12 difference there uh, between the gamma rays and the SHF wave bands, which are radio waves. Um, it, it's really quite surprising. And the importance of this comes when we see the effects of this magnetic field. Now, um, we've got the, the solar wind, but do bear in mind, as I mentioned before, there's no air in space. So by, by calling it a wind, we refer to the fact that it's throwing matter at us and this plasma um, is, is a pretty well continuous stream that's getting thrown out from the sun all over the place. There are two major types of um, concerning uh, uh, radiation. And one is the coronal, coronal mass ejection. And that's a burst of magnetic energy radiation borne by the solar wind. And it can take some days to reach us in actual fact. It's not instantaneous. Uh, but some really powerful CMEs, when they take place, can arrive within a, a couple of hours. But generally speaking, it would normally take a few days before we, we can see it, but we don't feel the effect of it. And it can cause all sorts of things like disruption to satellites, communications. And uh, we've been very lucky over here in, and in Europe, but the, the United States and Canada have actually had massive power grid failures as a result of the energy hitting them and taking out their communications. The other one, uh, that's the coronal mass ejection, is a solar flare. And they have burst of light energy, mostly photons, that come from sunspot activity. And when we've got a high sunspot activity, which we have at the ver this moment, um, they can also cause disruptive effects. Uh, and they actually run on an 11 year solar cycle. And at the moment, we've got plenty of activity going on around us. When this energy comes into our atmosphere, it strikes, particularly the stratosphere, when this energy comes in, it hits the, um, the stratosphere and chemically reacts with the gases that are up there. And the gases, there are, there are many up there, um, but the one that we're concerned about is the ozone layer. The ozone layer protects us from uh, harmful U, uh, UV radiation, ultraviolet radiation from the sun. And I'll just tell you here for convenience, the two types of UV that we're concerned about are UVA and UVB. UVA causes aging in human skin. 
uh, QVB causes burning. Now that's nice, simple to remember. AB, aging and burning. And um, burning is the one that gives rise to cancer, uh, skin cancer. And so we shouldn't spend too much time under the sunlight. Now, when this energy arrives, it attacks the oxygen. In fact, it splits the oxygen away from the hydrogen molecules for any water vapor in the atmosphere. It splits them apart. It then further splits the oxygen atoms, uh, the oxygen molecule, I should say, into two oxygen atoms. And they then immediately look for something to bond to. And what they will bond to is another oxygen molecule. So we've got an O2 molecule and an O, and they will bond and become an O3 molecule. And these, the um, reaction is so straightforward, I can tell you. It's uh, three O2, so that's three O2 molecules, oxygen molecules, subject to uh, sunlight, will break down into two O3 molecules. So that's two ozone molecules as a result of breaking up of three oxygen molecules. And the ozone is Im imperative for our protection from the harmful UV radiation. And when we get holes in the ozone layer, which we have had in the last few decades, um, it's not at all secure yet. Uh, in long term, it is mending itself and it will in the fullness of time. But in the meantime, um, polar areas, particularly uh, nations like Australia and New Zealand, are suffering terribly from excess uh, solar radiation. And it's damaging to not only us, but it's damaging to wildlife, fauna, and indeed the amount of UV radiation reaching the barrier reef, which is a coral, uh, and it can damage that too. So it's damaging to life and it's affecting our weather. Now, as you can see on this graphic, the, the ozone layer uh, protects all the stuff in the stra uh, stratosphere. But we've got two types of, we've got stratospheric ozone, that's the one we just discussed, but there's also tropospheric ozone, which is created near the surface. Uh, and that's produced by chemical reactions, mainly from pollution or industrial gas is produced and pumped out into our atmosphere. Um, there are uh, NOx, uh, uh, hydrocarbons and nitrous, various oxides of nitrogen that uh, can conform and um, cause these and they make terrible um, terribly powerful greenhouse gases now having said that we've now got to the point where we're bringing stuff into the atmosphere and in the stratosphere where um, we used to say not long ago but we were we didn't think weather existed but now of course we know it does and when these chemicals reactions take place we get ununiform uh, ununiform heating in the stratosphere which causes air to move from one area to a low we get differential uh, pressure areas um, and we get stratospheric winds now but we, we didn't think existed before uh, they and add to the winds that are taking place below in the troposphere. Specifically, the, the, the winds in the stratosphere enhance the wind layer that's at the base of the stratosphere, which is the jet stream. And the jet stream is very important to how our weather forms and it enhances the jet stream and makes it more powerful and gives us stronger, more violent weather than we would normally have. So that's where all the influence is taking place all this way down. Now, I'm going to go further on beyond that now, because I mentioned how far reaching the meteorologist works. And I'll show you this, where our work goes down below, actually to below the sea floor. And, and that's because volcanoes take place there. We have a mid-ocean ridge. Uh, in the centre of all the, the great seas or the oceans. There's a Pacific one, North Pacific, South Pacific. We've got a South uh, Atlantic and a North Atlantic mid-ocean ridge. And the North Atlantic one comes to the surface, would you believe, in Iceland. Uh, and that's where the, the seafloor spreading is actually arriving at the surface. And you can actually see the cleft in our earth 
where Iceland is. You can take an aerial view and you can see that mid-ocean ridge where Iceland is splitting apart. The important thing is the volcanic action on the sea floor, and there's also volcanic action uh, at the adjacent landmass where there are mountain ranges. And the important thing about these is they throw billions of tons of dust into the atmosphere billions of tons but the important thing i want to get across to you is that these dust particles are so tiny so very very tiny that it would take a million of them would fill a teaspoon so that give you some idea of size tiny tiny uh, bits of dust bit specks of dust and if you um the good the, the thing about water is on recording our water can't form a droplet on its own it has to form on a surface and in this case it forms on one of these tiny granules of specks of dirt and it clings to that and wraps envelops it and then the agitation in the atmosphere with winds and what have you they will eventually bump into each other collide and grow into what we call a water droplet or a raindrop and become visible the earlier stages where they were so tiny are not visible to the naked eye. You can, you, they're difficult to see. You need a microscope. Uh, if you held up a teaspoon right now, that I can tell you there'll be a million water droplets in there as you speak. You won't see them. You won't feel them because the water vapor is all around it. We need it to breathe. We need it to exist. It's essential to life um, and certainly life as we understand it. So. Once we've got these water droplets, what happens then is they get thrown up into the atmosphere and eventually condense, cloud forms, and the water droplets eventually become large enough to fall as rain. And that's where we get we absolutely essential to all the life forms on Earth is the water droplets that are formed as a result of this whole process of the incoming solar radiation the energy coming in, both in light and um, ultraviolet and, and light and electromagnetic radiation coming into our atmosphere, eventually finding its way, um, the energy finding its way uh, and joining up with the speckles of dirt that are coming up out of the ground, out of the earth and forming the water, which is life-saving for us. And if we get the wrong balance, which can happen over millions of years, we'll get changes in our planet's weather systems. So it's important that we take care of them right now. And I think that's probably uh, a good position to just uh, last slide of the day. Uh, the volcanoes are happening all the time. I'll just remind you, this was just a few months back uh, in January when we had a massive uh, volcano, undersea volcano off the island of N near Tonga in the South Pacific. And that's a good point in time for me to say questions and answers. Well, um, uh, about my career, it involves all, a whole manner of things. Um, most of my job is, is training these days, but on a normal typical day when I was actually performing the task, I, was, uh, I would be at an air station, a Royal Naval Air Station, or well, nowadays, uh, perhaps on a, any ship, because all surface ships carry a flight. And my main task would be not to for give forecasts to the ship, although that would be a, that would be a, a role. Um, but my particular role would be to give the flight briefings to the air crews, because they would need to know what the weather conditions were going to be like when they took off. Uh, they would need to know what the conditions were going to be like when they return, and they would need to know the conditions are like wherever it is they're going in between. So it's a, it's a, it's a quite a pressurised role because at the end of the day, it could be somebody like me who tells them they're not going anywhere because if the weather isn't good enough, that I have I, uh, people like me have the power to ground the flight. Does that answer your question? Uh, uh, in a field of conflict, it's the meteorologist that tells fighter pilots uh, how low they can go without leaving a con condensation trail, because the last thing a combat pilot wants is to leave a, a condensation trail, 
and it's the me meteorologist uh, who who decides that. Okay, you have another question, Peter. What qualifications did you need to get started with the Navy? Actually, none, because the Navy, like most service organisations, will train you up from, from next to zero. But having said that, you need, um, for this particular type of work, because it's uh, physics uh, and it's quite heavy on the maths, although a lot of it's automated now, at the end of the day, you need, you need maths and physics and English too, because you may well have to write reports and, and write stuff up. Um, and, but yes, you can, uh, you can join. The, all the services will take you on uh, with just about any job you can imagine, believe it or not. They need barbers, they need firemen, they need uh, solicitors, they need uh, cooks. Uh, they need everything, every job you can imagine. Uh, but... Um, uh, the ah, that's an interesting one. Um, so yeah, anybody can uh, anybody can get in, and they will train you up, and that's that's a good thing too. If you've got, you might need um, your O levels to get into college, uh, uh, so that uh, they will take you on board as a scientist, or whatever it is. Um, but um, you, they will look favourably on you. And if you are a scientist or you do have a special subject or a special leaning, they can train you for officer um, status, which is obviously a little bit better than, uh, than an, an observer, which is what I, I train observers. But you can do that as a rating. Um, what do we have envisage rising sea levels having on space weather in particular it's the other way around um the the uh the, the varying space weather if it carries on the way it is at the moment we've got an excess of uh, greenhouse gases which are partly contributed by space weather um the sea levels will continue to rise and that's a snowball effect and they've already started to rise the snowball comes when there's um, an ongoing chain reaction whereby the water levels rise, the water is uh, warmer than the ice, the ice melts, becomes water, so the level levels rise a bit more and it just goes on until we have what's called um, a, a, an iceless earth, which has happened in our past. Millions of years ago, um, long before I was born, I have to say, it... Uh, it, uh, it's a, a particular problem and global warming, uh, I hate that phrase, um, but it, climate change will have an adverse effect on sea levels. And if we allow the ozone layer to become as damaged as it has been of late, um, it, will, um, it will aggravate the situation further. Hope that's answered your question. Say a huge thank you to Peter for sharing your amazing knowledge of space weather and exploring the changing environmental conditions in near Earth space with us. I'm not sure many of us considered how magnetic fields, radiation and the particles of matter ejected from the sun interact with our upper atmosphere. Thank you for sharing your work with us. You're Peter welcome. Is I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm so glad that you've enjoyed it. Um, I've just posted the link to Peter's article in Catalyst magazine, which is an absolutely brilliant read. So please do go and read it. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. The next session will be held in early July and we'll look at tissue engineering and how it allows us to build organs in the laboratory. We now hand over to Chris, who will showcase how today's topic can be used to support curricular learning. Hey, thanks, Joe, and um, thank you, Peter, for a fascinating talk. Um, the next 15 minutes or so is just really a brief discussion of some resources that we've put together um, that supports this, uh, this event. So um, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, you'll see that we've got Catalyst Magazine Live, uh, Weather, Earth and Beyond, and we've got about five different resource listings um, that all relate really to the, the topics that you've just been uh, hearing about. Um, these are designed for teachers. Uh, so I am talking mostly to, to any teachers or educators that, that might be with us today. Um, but if you are a student, uh, some of these may also be uh, interesting to yourselves as well to have a look at in your own time. Uh, so there's about five of these that I'm going to go through. 
Um, they're all located on this page. This is our web page, which uh, contains all of these different links. Um, and I have just put uh, something in the chat, which you'll be able to access. And uh, hopefully, if you click on that link, that should take you to this page. OK, so the first one, then, is all about space weather effects. Uh, so what this this sort of category here of, of resources is about, it's a big collection of, of resource packs, um, it's looking at real world data. So if I bring up a couple of the Word documents um, that this relates to, I'll be able to give you a sort of quick um, tour of, of some of these resources. Uh, so. Um, the philosophy behind these is really that we can get students really engaged with um, space science and, and particularly space weather, um, as is the, the, the case with this particular topic, uh, by looking at real world data and uh, data that comes back from the likes of satellites that are in orbit. Um, in this case, around the around the sun. Uh, so we're looking at uh, the Solar and Heliospheric yeah. Observatory, uh, called SOHO for short, um, which has been observing uh, the sun. And you can see that uh, some of the images that we're provided with here is showing things like these coronal mass ejections, these big solar flares, uh, which are sending out uh, an enormous amount of radiation. Now, further down on the worksheets, uh, what we've got is, is further images that have been captured um, by a satellite that's, that's out in orbit. Um, and you can see that uh, the, the impact of this, this radiation, when the sun um, produces one of these, these mass ejections, it actually creates um, a sort of snow effect, uh, really, on the, the, the imagery that we're getting back from the satellite. And that's caused by the, uh, the effect of the, the radiation as it interacts with some of the satellite sensors. And um, what we can actually do, uh, using this sort of data, because it's all got timestamps on it, uh, we can actually calculate how long uh, this, uh, this, this radiation burst has actually taken to reach uh, all the way from the sun through to this satellite. And if we know what the, the orbital um, uh, distance is of that satellite away from the sun, we can start to work out uh, the speed of this radiation, how long it's actually taking to get there. So um, this is a, an example of applied data. We're, we're looking at real world data that's coming back from these satellites and using that uh, to go through some uh, mathematical calculations um, and look at uh, some of the impacts of, uh, of, of real-world phenomena um, on our real-world applications. Uh, so various questions that are associated with that um, at the end there. Uh, what we've also got is um, another worksheet here, space weather and dodgy data. Uh, so this is all about the impact of space weather on GPS um, global positioning system satellites. Uh, so lots of us use GPS these days. Uh, it's in our, our car. Um, satellite navigation systems. Uh, some of you that are into fitness may have GPS watches uh, that track your, your positions and the speed of, uh, of, of yourself when you're doing a run, for example. Um, well, actually, space weather can actually impact on the accuracy of those receivers um, and affect the, the accuracy of the data that you're getting back. So again, we've got some real world data here showing uh, the, the variance um, of uh, some of that data that's been been reported back by a GPS receiver unit um, caused by uh, space weather. Uh, so what we can do, again, there's a series of questions that follow on from this that, that ask you uh, questions about that data uh, and ask you to um, really sort of come up with estimates of things like uh, the, the amount of error that's associated with the data and the impact that the space weather is having um, on the overall accuracy of the data that you're receiving. Okay, so um, various different sort of worksheet type activities uh, that we can we can look at there. Uh, the next one, planetary heat pumps, is um, is actually a, a resource pack from the European Space Agency, uh, which looks at various different scientific investigations um, aimed at ages fourteen to sixteen, so so key stage four in, in the UK. Um, and it's looking at various science, science investigations that discuss ocean circulation and ways in which we can replicate ocean thermodynamics and stratification. Uh, so, again, the emphasis here is that we can look at um, real world data uh, that comes back from, from satellites uh, in orbit around the Earth, uh, monitoring things like Earth's ocean currents, uh, and convective currents and such like, but then applying that into classroom type activities. Uh, so, for example, ways in which we can um, investigate things like convective currents in the oceans uh, using uh, simple food dye um, in, in various different um, temperatures of, of, of water. Um, and look at analysing some of the data that comes back from that and then making those links to, to the real world. Um, Peter mentioned about the, the Gulf Stream. Uh, so there are activities here which um, are looking at uh, data 
Uh, so this is a, a spreadsheet type exercise. So we're looking at real world data, uh, analyzing the impact of the Gulf, Gulf Stream um, and making various calculations uh, that, that stem from that. And also starting to look at um, impacts on things like um, Atlantic um, Ocean sea surface temperatures um, and seeing whether or not there's any evidence for uh, global warming, whether there's any overall pattern or shift over um, a long period of time. Okay, so um, there's uh, those planetary heat pump resources. Um, I'm just going to get to the, the next uh, set of resources. The next one that I'll focus on is space weather. Uh, so this is from the Met Office. Um, and again, Peter was talking about the uh, Aurora. Uh, so this is um, quite, a, quite a fascinating web page, really, because it provides all sorts of forecast information about um, space weather and the impact that it's likely to be having on Earth. Um, I find these particular images, these, these animations, quite mesmerizing. Um, these are, are images that can be uh, downloaded, um, but they can be displayed full screen as well. And what we're looking at here um, is the Aurora Borealis um, forecast predictions. So you can actually see this um, over the next few days or so and where the Aurora is predicted to be. Um, equally, uh, there's another animation that shows um, the Aurora Australis. So we've got the Southern Hemisphere there as well. And various other forecast overviews uh, depicting what the solar activity is going to be, solar wind, um, four day space weather forecast activities, um, energetic particles and solar radiation and so on and so on. So there's quite a lot of information in there um, if you're interested in space weather or if your students are interested in that. Um, next one is Space Weather Live. So this is a bit more involved. Um, so it goes beyond simple animations to really providing you with a complete dashboard, uh, really, of, of information all relating, again, to uh, various atmospheric phenomena uh, and, again, uh, space weather and what's happening with the, uh, with the sun. Um, the thing that's interesting about this is that much of the data sets that underpin some of these graphics that you see uh, can be downloaded um, and you can actually um, click some of these tabs here and get more data. Uh, so you can do various exercises with students, um, getting them to analyze the data for themselves and, uh, and make their own conclusions based on uh, some of the phenomena that, that, they're, that they're seeing. Uh, but there's quite a bit uh, to go at here. Uh, we've got, again, the auroral oval. Uh, we've got um, uh, various predictions about the speed of the solar wind, um, magnetic field, and so on and so on. Okay, um, and the last one that I'll reference that is within this resource collection is, is aimed at uh, slightly younger students. Uh, so this will be more appropriate maybe for probably upper key stage two, maybe into key stage three. Uh, so if any students are starting to express an interest in uh, what the sun is doing, then we've got uh, this, this NASA uh, science page here, uh, Space Place, uh, which talks in detail, um, about the right level of detail, I think, for that sort of age group, on particularly sunspots and solar flares. Uh, so sunspots, um, these, these regions of the sun or the sun's atmosphere, uh, which is slightly cooler uh, than the, the, the rest of the surrounding atmosphere and therefore appears slightly darker in contrast. Um, and you've got, again, some, some quite um, spectacular imagery and animations uh, and video clips that depict some of these, these phenomena uh, happening. So a uh, large solar flare, for example. Um, what you've also got um, is... Uh, is some information there generally about magnetic fields and and solar activity uh, in general so again it's a good uh, a good website to, to have a look at in general um, you don't have to restrict that just to sunspots and solar flares but uh, we'll pick that particular page because it does relate to what we've covered uh, today okay so um, just going back to the main screen again um, all of those resources uh, you'll be able to have a look through yourself um, if they're of interest to you, um, particularly if you're an educator and you want to use any of those with your students um, and you want to relate that to what you've just heard about today in today's talk, uh, then you'll find all of those on that resource page listing. Um, you should have a link in the chat, uh, but we will put it at the end of the video clip as well. Okay, so um, that's all from me. Uh, it's just a sort of short session just to um, uh, reference those resources and tell you where they are. Um, and unless Jo has anything else that she wants to say, um, I will close it there. So thanks ever so much for listening. Uh, and thanks again to Peter for a great talk. And uh, we hope to see you uh, again for, for the next event uh, later on in, in July, I believe.